Okay, thank you for inviting me, and today I'll be talking for about half an hour on the science of quantitative DNA mixture interpretation. Uh, in particular, I was asked to speak about true allele casework. True allele is a system that some of you know that's been around for about 10 years. It does quantitative uh, interpretation of STR data, which you'll see. Uh, it does a statistical search using a probability model, which you'll see. And the concept of it is to preserve all the identification information that's present in the data. So you collect evidence, you run it through the laboratory, and then you have STR data that's highly quantitative. And the question is, how can you keep all that identification information present? It objectively infers genotypes without ever seeing suspects, and only afterwards does a match against one or a whole CODIS database of suspects. It can use any number of mixture contributors. It models stutter, peak imbalance, degraded DNA, and so on. Importantly, as we'll see, it calculates the uncertainty of every peak. We'll see why that's important. It was created over 10 years ago. It's now in its 25th version. It's been used on over 100,000 evidence samples. And I'll mention at the end, it's available as a product, as a service, or both. So I've structured this talk to do nothing more than answer the five questions, well, a little more, but relatively not much more than answering the five questions that Heather had posed us. So the first question is, what advancements have been made in your casework software that would make the software eligible to be a casework expert system? Okay, so if we go back to the beginning, kind of year zero, around 2000 when people were coming out with uh, mixture interpretation. From the very beginning, the concept was to model the quantitative data. In green, you see data. This is from a two-person mixture with a major and a minor component, for example. And the goal is to come up with patterns, we'll talk about that in a minute, of, and you see those as gray triangles underneath. By the way, virtually all the pictures that you're seeing here are taken uh, from the True Allele viewer interface, because that's how I prepare talks. I just, you just kind of grab them off. This, this is looking at data. So this is explaining the data, and here you see quantitative, certain a quantity of DNA and maybe a stutter peak, other quantities, and the concept is, is that the gray pattern fits or matches or explains what the green data EPG signal is. So that's old, modeling quantitative data. What's newer, and I spoke about last year and throughout this year in various talks, is modeling peak uncertainty. If you observe a peak uh, in STR data, it's not really a peak. It's a sample if you were to keep repeating that experiment over and over again and reamping it and running it on your sequencer. You'd get a probability distribution of different peaks that can occur. And taller peaks have a higher spread, though a smaller coefficient of variation, lower peaks have a greater relative spread and a smaller absolute spread, and you need to model the peak uncertainty so you know what the data is trying to tell you about what is this peak, what does this peak mean? And if you don't model the peak uncertainty, you basically can't do quantitative mixture interpretation because you don't know uh, to what extent those peaks are in one place or in some other place uh, representing the underlying uh, chemical mass that's present. The way this works is that the computer will inf try to infer an accurate genotype. Again, I'm giving references across the top. At the end, everything that I'm referencing is available online so that you can download and look at as articles or presentations. So this is sort of references to those. I d didn't have time to do three days of a workshop here, so you can Anyway, so if you look at the background of what the data would be with its uncertainty, imagine there's a tall peak, some smaller peaks, and so on. Imagine that the computer proposes, well, maybe in blue there's a minor contributor with two alleles, and there's a uh, major contributor, different individual, and that's an orange homozygote. And if I had this amount and these proportions of alleles, uh, this is sort of explaining where the data would be. This isn't accounting yet for stutter, prevent, and so on. The computer tries out all patterns like this, of all quantities, all alleles, all mixed proportions, and that's what computers are good at. 
And by trying out every possibility, it can work out how well each one explains the data. It's using a likelihood function. And the better it explains it, the higher the probability. After it's tried out all of them, it ends up with a probability distribution, which we'll be seeing more of. Um, and that from that probability distribution of the genotypes, you can then immediately report out a likelihood ratio, which is a match statistic of how much more does the suspect match the evidence than some random person. This is referring to a recent Promega talk that I gave where I showed there are four, there are many, but four equivalent ways of, a, of using a likelihood ratio, some of which are more English and human friendly than others. Uh, this one is particularly human friendly in that there's no conditional probability, there's no transposition. They're all the same mathematically, but it's sort of easier to say in court that a match between the suspect and the evidence is a billion times more probable than a coincidence. That sounds better than some other things you may have seen. You could read the paper for that. But that's been a recent advance trying to get the community more comfortable with expressing DNA match information. Uh, using likelihood ratios, which can preserve themselves more of the information. Question two, are there issues that are still being addressed prior to releasing to laboratories for this consideration? I don't know exactly what that means, but that's the question I had. Uh, the answer is no, there are no issues. This is the system that's out there that people are starting to work with. Uh, from the user side, this is all you see. There's a large screen computer, could be a Mac or a PC. Most people prefer to work with Macintoshes. And it's running a visual user interface. You'll be seeing some of those interfaces throughout the talk, because again, most of the pictures I just take by cutting and pasting. There's a database server that's running uh, with it another uh, four or eight parallel processes. The reason it's a parallel system and you can get expansion modules with another uh, eight or 10 parallel processes, is that in order to work out what the uncertainty of every peak in the data is, you end up, instead of having a handful of random variables to work on, like genotype and mixture weight or stutter, you end up with thousands of variables that include all the peak uncertainty. But until you model all the peak uncertainty and you know what the spread around every peak is, you really can't make a, it's like thresholds, but on steroids, done at every peak with a probability distribution. That takes a lot of computer time. If you see some, someone saying, oh, I can solve a mixture in one second, um, we were doing that 10 years ago, and, you, and it it's, gets silly because the answers can be quite incorrect on occasion if you haven't modeled the certainty of your data at every peak. So the computer spends a lot of time on peak uncertainty, and therefore we have a parallel system in our office. I think we're up to 36 parallel processors. And so if you let the computer take an hour or two to solve each one, then you get every few minutes another answer comes off the production line. In addition to hardware, which people like to look at, and um, machines, this is what you see, that's in the back room. We also, in any rollout, do a lot of support. Uh, that's where we spend almost all of our time. Uh, we do an initial process planning. We provide a lot of science education because most practitioners are not yet completely familiar with quantitative mixture interpretation uh, using probability. We provide, of course, software training for about a week, user documentation. We go through the data. We pre-validate. We have regular ongoing meetings and project management working the workflow into the laboratory and then, of course, provide support for testifying. Question three. Uh, why can Trulil be relied upon as an expert system? Well, there are two answers. The first one is we've validated the thing quite a bit over the last 10 years and published quite a bit. Uh, this is a paper coming out in JFS in November with the New York State Lab. And so we've, we look at two things that we really care about for court. One is how much information do we preserve from the evidence? And secondly, how reproducible uh, is that? So. Here's how much information. In this study, there were eight different mixture items uh, that were looked at. And you see, this is on a log scale, the likelihood ratio. It turns out that the log of likelihood ratio is a standard measure of information. You, the same way you multiply probabilities, you can add logs of probabilities, because it's a logarithm. And so here are the additive units, a 5, 10, 15 is, say, a um, quadrillion to 1. 
And truly along these cases, in this case, uh, I guess there were two person mixtures. And in this series, we assume that we did not know the, uh, any victim. So it solves the two unknown contributor case. And 10 to the 13th was the average amount of information preserved. And using the CPI inclusion method on the identical data, what was reported in the lab was 10 to the 7th, or 10 million. So that's 10 trillion versus 10 million. And the difference is 10 to the 6th, or about a million to 1. So the answer is that, yes, it preserves information generally about a million times more than human review. There was another axis that looked at CLR for, uh, when you did know the victim. We also validated reproducibility. Some of you may remember John Butler's classic slide showing 10 orders of magnitude variation in a human review of the same mixture sample from 10 to the 14th to, uh, 10, down to the 10 to the 4th. Uh, instead of 10 orders of magnitude, we measure the reproducibility on the statistical program the order of 1 tenth of a log unit. So it's quite reproducible. And we can measure that, and we do that in our validation study. So it's efficacious. It's reproduced. This is another study that um, Dr. Deusman and I presented at the Australian meeting this year. Here we took all 86 items of evidence, and, if you, and we ranked them by how much information was reported as the log of the likelihood ratio, the same scale, uh, 10 to the 5th, 10 to the 10th, quadrillion to 1, 10 to the 20th, and so on. And here in blue, you see how much information is preserved by running at the by computer. This was all done in duplicate for the study. Of those 86 items, about 30% of them had any reported match score. The others got difficult or they just some, they weren't reported. Uh, there are different methods, uh, whether you assume it's single source and look at the majors. This is using the victim. In orange, it's not using the victim. The key point of this is that Quantitative interpretation preserved the information all the time and was able to produce a match statistic, whereas the human review with the threshold back then in the old days of 50 or a few, if you remember those good old days, uh, the peak threshold methods were discarded information 70% of the time. 70% of the time, there's no match score being reported. And if you think of each piece of evidence as something that can be used as an item to either convict a criminal or thereby prevent another crime, having a large false negative rate of what's not being reported can have social or very human implications. It's also been used in court, uh, which is nice. Uh, and we have a number of publications on this, but this newsletter is probably the easiest introduction to what happened in the Foley case. Commonwealth of Pennsylvania versus Foley, great story. I've done two hour lectures on it, not today. Uh, including CLEs, the lawyers love it, they stay till the end, it's got everything, murder, death, DNA, sex, I mean, it, it's, it's an amazing, really weird personality. Um, so if you just like entertaining stuff, you might want to read it. But the FBI managed to get DNA from under, as a 6.7% 6, 6 minor contributor, and using inclusion, they had a match score of 13,000. And another expert had an obligate allele method of 23 million, and true allele ran it. I then compared afterwards with a suspect with 189 billion max score, as expected, about a million times more information. And again, in this and in other cases, we see that probability modeling preserves information, whereas peak thresholds, as you might imagine, discard them. Uh, we've been using it as a reliable weight of evidence. Uh, when labs can't report a max score, they often ask cybergenetics to run true allele on it so we can infer and if report on it if necessary testify to some likelihood ratio match statistic which is required in many jurisdictions. Some in the US, these are different interesting cases including where someone did a free trial which I'll tell you about at the end and they took our preliminary report which we sent to them just for kicks and they showed it to the suspect who confessed. It was very dramatic. Uh, we hope to have a newsletter about that soon. They're fun cases. And we've also been testifying and doing cases overseas as well. For the rest of this talk, the example that I'll be using is a case that has some degraded DNA, because that was one of the questions that we were asked. Uh, that's from, it's from a Pennsylvania case. It's a two-person mixture. And I won't say what the case is. It's still pending. But I'll be using the data from that case. 
Question four, specifically how are mixtures addressed? Okay, well, you have some data here in green, and what I'm showing here from the explain interface is in gray, this is the victim's allele pair, and now, in this easy one unknown case, the computer tries out all possible allele pairs. Here's a 13, 14, in different mixing proportions. It tries out every possibility, each time generating a pattern. In this case, it explains uh, this amount of DNA with that mixture proportion uh, of that much gray to that much blue. Uh, with those allele pairs, explains the data very well. You see that the, the gray bars are pretty much explaining what you're seeing in the green data. But it tries absolutely everything. And when it's all finished, it has a probability distribution at every locus. And at one locus, since it's tried out all possible allele pairs, including off ladders and so on, it's looked at you know, thousands of possible allele pairs, of which very few are probable. In this case, it was that allele pair that we looked at, I think it was 13, 14, that was given virtually all the probability with a few other possibilities that were considered uh, feasible. And now, as you can read about in the Chromega paper, to get a likelihood ratio, if you look at this probability distribution, this is the probability distribution of the allele pairs at locus BWA of the unknown contributor after it's examined the data. Before you've examined the data, in brown, what you have is the probability distribution of the population. That's what you would believe before you looked at phenotypic data from SDRs. What somebody's genotype, I don't know, it's up to probability, it's whatever the population would be. One of the many ways of describing the likelihood ratio, which is nice if you know what a genotype is, is at the suspect's allele pair, we don't know what that is until we ask this question, and you see that there's a loss in probability at some allele pairs, there's a gain in others. What is the ratio of the genotype probability after you've seen the data divided by before? Here it's about a factor of six. That's one way to explain the likelihood ratio. Uh, and you can express that as a log factor, and again, report it as evidence to coincidence ratio of match. Uh, many ways to explain it. This is the most visual way I've come up with of what's the probability after relative to before, the po relative to the population. Uh, prosecutors like that. In fact, I've had situations where you show one to a prosecutor, and then you, I stop talking, they use the true interface, and they show it to the other prosecutors and police, and they're very excited about being able to explain likelihood ratios. Uh, as many people might be, right? Wouldn't be fun. Question five, how are the peak height differences addressed in terms of degradation versus mixture? The answer is, they're just more models. So in this case, over the whole course of the data, base pair versus RFU, in gray, there's not that much degradation of the known victim profile, but the degradation of uh, the unknown second contributor, which ends up matching with the suspect, but we don't know that when we solve the problem, has a decay um, with some uncertainty, and it's one more statistical parameter that's included, and it solves when you ask it to solve for degraded DNA, you can have any number of contributors, three or four, and it will look for the degradation of every con contributor independently that's in that mixture. As a separate variable, it also looks for the mixture weight of the template. Uh, the victim in this case, shown in gray, was the major contributor, about 75%, and the minor, with uh, the, a lot of variation of the data, which is why this is pretty broad, this is mixture weight. Uh, and that's the percentage, I say 30% or so, and that's the probability distribution around it. Uh, the, prob the mixture weight's determined at each locus, but this is the mixture weight of the underlying template, which is trying to tell you what's happening in the DNA as the proportion of the contributors in, in the sample. Okay, so now we have a little more time, and I wanted to ask two more questions. The first question is, why don't thresholds work? I'm sure you ask yourself this question all the time. I guess not. But I'm asking it for you, and so we'll take a look at it, and we'll go see why. The first answer is, and these are very much intermingled, is that with thresholds, you're looking at the wrong data using the wrong model. 
you have quantitative data with real peaks that are trying to tell you how much of something is there. When you apply a threshold, you ignore the quantitative information. Over the threshold, peaks are treated as allele events, so it's all or none. Under the threshold, peaks don't exist. And so now you've truncated your data down to either it's there or it's not. But of course, that's not what the chemistry is telling you. There are certain amounts of things in that data. And in statistics, when you do inference, the one thing you're never allowed to do is mess with your data. If the data come in quantitative, you're supposed to model in that way. And so the problem here is that the model is an all or none binary model, whereas your data is continuous. That's the first place where things start going wrong. Second place is of why thresholds can't work is that the uncertainty model is wrong. You know, if you had a certain amount of background and you're asking with constant variation, am I seeing something over a background, like a threshold detect, uh, like a signal detection, is there something that's noise or not noise? You could construct one fixed bell curve and look at what's to, to the left or right of it. Modern statistics would tend not to do that. You work out a probability. But you could do it. But the variation that's of most interest for dropout and PCR variation and stochastic effects is the variation in the PCR or the dropout itself. And there, it's a different amount of variation depending on how much DNA there is. The more DNA, the more variation. The less DNA, the less variation. So if you try to draw one line through all this mass of variation, your assumption that there's one variation that's fixed around a peak is just wrong. It can't be. It's chemistry. If you double the peak height, you double the variance. If you quadruple the peak height, you quadruple the variance, which, as you know, the standard deviation is the square root of the variance. So you, um, it, you would double the standard deviation. And think about that. If you have a model where you're assuming that variance is fixed, but nature is telling you, if you look at the data or do repetitive PCR experiments or do anything, that the variation changes with the, with the quantity, then any model, whether it's on a computer, statistic, by hand, or by eye, that assumes a fixed variation is wrong. And therefore, it will start losing information because it's the wrong model. You can take a look at the talk from the Canada talk uh, where I go into more detail about this. The result of having a bad model is that instead of concentrating probability where the data are trying to tell you quantitatively the allele pairs are, like in the CPI method, this is the probability distribution in this case, but a Pennsylvania case, is VWA. All mixture methods produce probability distributions. That's just what they do mathematically, and you can read about that in various papers that people write. You may not know that's what they're doing, but that's what they're doing. In light blue, this is the probability distribution that comes from considering in CPI, which is what the lab did. This is, this is the probability distribution of what the lab reported. You, dis, you diffuse the probability over all these events that have to do with are alleles there or not, as opposed to looking at the quantitative peak heights. And so you diffuse your probability over all these impossible events that the quantitative data does not support, therefore reducing the probability at the correct place the correct allele pair with the result that you've reduced your likelihood ratio. That's how diffusing probability with thresholds reduces your match statistic and loses information. That's the mechanism. The result here uh, is that I've shown at every locus the top bar is true allele. This is on a linear scale of what the likelihood ratio is. And the bottom bar is what the lab reported. In red, you see all the all the loci where they said nothing at all because the data with thresholds didn't match the suspect. You see there's a lot of information being thrown out, 50, 35, 40, whatever. Uh, and highly informative data is being translated as a null event. And the result is instead of reporting out a number close to 10 trillion, they report out a number of 43,000, which is why the prosecutor called us because this is a particularly vicious stabbing, 30 sta I mean, a vicious murder. Uh, and he didn't want to go to court with that as a match statistic. But it's actually quite worse than that, because if there was a good defense, 
you all know about co-ancestry and confidence intervals, right? Okay, so if you consider co-ancestry, what's the probability of seeing another genotype allele pair, given you've already seen it in the population, suddenly it's not so rare. No, a normal defense expert will make you consider at least a 3% co-ancestry if you hadn't done your 1% ahead of time. And you can also compute confidence intervals around the likelihood ratio. This is due to the fact that our population databases have 100 alleles in them, not uh, 10,000 or 30,000 alleles the way some other countries like Australia have. And so we have broadened confidence intervals. And that left number with co-ancestry, true allele drops down to 13 billion, which still sat on this particular case, which sounds uh, pretty compelling to a jury. But now you're down into the thousands. And CPI, inclusion methods, will, the thresholds will be dropping you down into the hundreds and thousands on a regular basis if you have a competent defense opposition, considering co-ancestry and confidence intervals. Another phenomenon, uh, which again is in the Canadian talk, is we did a study looking at mixture, known mixed proportions, 50-50, 30-70, 90-10, of different DNA concentrations. This is the most and then to the least. This is with thresholds. We did it at 50, 100, and 200, 200 being most relevant now, uh, given stochastic thresholds that people are using that tend to have gone up. You're seeing that with imbalanced mixtures, you're losing at the rate of one allele per locus. And if you think of an imbalanced mixture, you can see if you draw a threshold, you begin losing the, the minor contributor. And when you quantify it, you end up with about more than one per and an, out, an, an error rate of missing things of over 100% is highly unusual in science. Think of, I don't know, a diagnostic medical procedure that was wrong, you know. Uh, missing, again, it's not that when you get a hit it's not right. It's that you're missing what's really there, letting criminals wander about. CODIS suffers from the same information loss because it also uses the allele approach. And it loses that same factor of a million or renders highly informative information like we saw in the 70% in this other study of mixtures, quote, inconclusive, which often is not, most of the time, is not inconclusive at all. Usually if you can see it, a computer can extract it. The true allele database stores and matches probabilistic genotypes and uses likelihood ratios to preserve that identification information. It's good in casework with convicted offenders and evidence. We used it when we reanalyzed the World Trade Center data. It's good for identifying missing people. True allele can also do kinship uh, calculations. Again, it's probability distributions and likelihood ratios. And when it does familial search, it's not one of these processes where you have to do anything. It's just fully automatic. The same way you'd be matching against convicted offenders, it just automatically matches against the family members you're looking for, the genotypes, the family members that you're looking for, and let you know when you find something. There's nothing you have to do, kind of like with CODIS. Um, and of course, we customize whatever the match rules are to each state's or country's own uh, regulations and statutes. This was fascinating. I don't know if any of you, if you know that there's a controversy between Bruce Bodoli and John Buckleton? OK. Um, this was an amazing closed session. Uh, in September uh, in Sydney, and Peter Gill, uh, Dr. Van Dahl, the four of them really had a wonderful time. You may have heard about this meeting, but it was quite traumatic. Sparks were flying. And at the end, I was asked, to ask, I'd given some talks there, I was asked to find some consensus, which was almost funny after the panel discussion. Uh, and this is what they would all, they did agree to. Uh, DNA data is continuous and has random variation, though Bruce Bodoli preferred the word stochastic effect, but we thought that was okay, whatever. It's random. Uh, thresholds do not work for low template DNA. All four of them agree to that. Mathematical models can account for random variation. All four agree to that. And it's on your slide, but they also agree to my summation statement that objective computer interpretation that can infer genotypes up to probability is the way to move forward which was very nice, then I stopped. <laughs> Question B, how can I learn more about scientific DNA mixture interpretation that uses all the quantitative data? And included in this is you're gonna be asking some questions, so I'm gonna end in just a second. 
Cybergenetics has been preparing resource after resource of online courses, conference presentations. We've been writing papers, validation studies, newsletters. It goes on and on and on. Um, the courses, we have about 12 lectures that we use that bring basic and more advanced uh, for scientists and lawyers. Uh, presentations, and for any of these we have handouts, we make narrated movies from the PowerPoint slides, we provide transcripts so you can read them, uh, handouts and so on, and same, similarly for the publications, the manuscripts are all up there. As soon as anything goes out, it's up on our website. Okay. Uh, and so if you're interested in the science of quantitative DNA mixture interpretation, if you go to our website under information, look under the tabs for links for courses, presentations, and publications, and there's a lot of stuff. I got an email from a group in England this morning. They wanted to know if they could use the Broughton case that we did in Oxford this summer with a joint interpretation. Could she use it in her mixture course? I said, replied on my iPhone, sure, we're driving down this morning. Sure, all this stuff is up there. Whatever you want, it's freely available. Please use it in your teaching. The other thing is that is this concept of services. You may have this idea of, you know, I'm really comfortable with what I'm doing now. Why would I want to change everything I'm doing, give up thresholds, and move to this notion of looking at all the quantitative data? You know, maybe it extracts more information. Maybe I'm letting thousands of criminals go over, but I'm, I'm not ready for it. OK, fair enough. So maybe you want to test it out and see how it works. Uh, open invitation to any crime lab, send us a few tests cases or items, we'll look at it, and we'll show you what we found. And this is your data, if, particularly if you didn't find anything. Now, if, you, if it's flatline noise data, please don't send it to us. <laughs> but if you're seeing peaks of 40 and 60, or, and that's it's stuff and it's interesting, sure. Then, you know, even peaks of 150, we don't mind. We'll look at that, too. Uh, do you have an important case that needs an answer? Sometimes you do. It's, it's important. There's, there's some particular heinous crime. You want to know what's going on. Well, again, it's free if you're police or prosecutor. Take care of it. Sometimes we get paid. Sometimes we don't. It depends. But the point is uh, some groups have learned more about it by seeing what happens uh, when they send out the data. And Again, if you're not ready to replace human review in your lab with or augment human review, uh, with computer interpretation. Uh, one thing you can do is to say, fine, anything that you can't analyze, this assumes that you've gone through steps one or two and you're comfortable already, all right, you know what's going on, is imagine that there are other technologies, like mitochondrial DNA, if, if you used a different lab assay, that could interpret your data, but in this case it's SDR data, and not only could it be reported on, it could be testified to and so on. And it's not your problem. Somebody else is taking care of it. But the case is still getting solved. That's another option. Because I know people aren't going to rush out and buy all these systems. Uh, but you might want to try it out and learn a lot more about it, either from web resources or with some actual cases that are interesting. Um, so you can, uh, you can always email me. But just don't send us data. Let us know what you're thinking. We have protocols that we can send you of you know, how we know what we're getting. So in conclusion, a quantitative DNA mixture interpretation preserves identification information. Uh, thresholds, this is shown over and over again, but I tried to not make it contentious and bring in all the philosophy that you sometimes, if they just discard information. As uh, the International Commission of Forensic Genetics said, um, it make, doesn't make as much use of the data that's there. Very polite way of saying it. Uh, but it does lose information. Uh, True Allele is a validated courtroom tested system. It's available today. And you can go right into lab-wide system implementation. Uh, or you could uh, use a forensic interpretation service that can complement the existing methods you currently use in your lab. Thank you. <laughs>